A, a, a madman. What kind of madman? Well, think about it. Just answer again. A crazy madman. Oh, you can do better than that. Free up your mind. Use your imagination. Say the first thing that pops into your head, even if it's total gibberish. Oh, uh, a, a sweaty tooth madman. Good God, boy. There's a poet in you after all. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And, you know, here on the channel, I, I like to talk a lot about the comic book industry, comic book news. And, you know, lately we've been talking a little bit more about maybe the craft of, or the craft of comic books, you know, as far as art and maybe breaking in. And today I have a, a real life writer on the channel, uh, Mark Pellegrini, who's worked a lot with Tim Lim on My Hero Magadamia, uh, Black Hops. He's got Common America out right now, uh, funding on Kickstarter. Mark, you're here to talk about comic book writing today, right? Yeah, that's what I'm here for. You didn't start out a comic book writer. You know, you, you had to, to uh, study about you know the, the craft and maybe do some trial and error. And we don't want the viewers to have to go through all the same steps you did. And so you're going to give some of your, your tricks of the trade and, and some things that people have to keep in mind where, uh, you know, comic book writing isn't exactly the same as, as uh, you know, script writing as, as far as television or movies, you know, with screenplays or or even writing for novels or, or novellas oh. or anything like that, right? Oh, yeah, it's true. Every, every medium has a, a different means of scripting and of writing. I mean, you don't write a short story the same way you'd write a novel. And we're talking prose. And you don't write a screenplay the same way you would write a comic book script. Now, the, the, nice, the nice thing about comic book scripts, though, is that there is no academic format for it. And I say that's the nice thing, you know, a lot of people that confuses them and makes getting started in writing comic book scripts kind of intimidating, intimidating or difficult. Because yeah. yeah, if you want to know how to write a screenplay, there's a thousand, you know, how-to guides to write screenplays because, you know, the movie industry has a format that you got to follow. If you want to write prose, I mean, there's lots of books telling you how to write prose, first person, second person, third person, that kind of thing. It's, it's all pretty standard. Comic books don't have that academic format, and so it's sort of a free-for-all, and and that can be a little difficult because then you don't have um, a structure to work from. And there are how-to guides out there, but every one is different from the other. Like there's the Marvel method, which is a totally different method of writing comic books than what I use when I work with uh, with Tim or, or other people. Um, and then there are people who write comic not uh, scripts, but they use more of a screenplay format. They even use, you know, phrases like exterior, pan, or you know, close up, you know, things like that, uh, just because that's that's a format that they're familiar with. My suggestion for people looking for the format that works for them when writing a comic script is to collaborate closely with your artist. Use the format that works best for the both of you that your, your artist can read your words and understand your, your structure, your panel structure, your layouts. And if that's what works organically with them, then that's the format you should use. I know that in writing for comics, a lot of the times the writer and the artist are almost kept separated by like an editor. And sometimes you have to use the format that works for the editor and you almost never talk to your artist and then you have no idea what your book's gonna look like. That's a uh, relationship I, and a dynamic I don't recommend. I almost think you should you should have an editor, but the editor shouldn't be a go-between between between you and the artist because you want you want your pick your words to be visualized the way you would you would like them to be visualized. And you want the and the artist obviously wants to have the creative freedom to interpret your words um, to a way they think works best. And the only way to do that, to have that harmony, is for the two of you to work together. <laughs> you know, so I've seen certain outlines where basically the the, the script itself is, are just scenes, and then the, the comic book is actually drawn and illustrated, and then they add words later. Would you suggest adding dialogue after the fact, or do you think there uh, should be dialogue in there so that so, you know how much, like the word balloons and stuff like that? Yeah, that's something I really don't recommend. That's the Marvel method. So the Marvel method, page one, and you do like a summary of what would be on the page. You don't break down the panels. You don't have any dialogue. You don't have any layouts. It's just like a, a two sentence summary of like, Spider-Man meets Dr. Octopus on this page. They fight. And then page two, Spider-Man knocks out Dr. Octopus and ties him up with his webbing. And then after the artist interprets those paragraphs into their page layouts and their panels, 
then the writer goes in, looks at the art, and makes up the conversation between the characters after the fact. It, it's good on perhaps an assembly line process. That's why it's the Marvel method. It was when Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all of them had to pump out, you know, 10 issues a month for comics, and they had to do it as quickly and expediently as they could. And so maybe that worked for them, but that's not the way comics are made now. And so I really wouldn't recommend it because the dialogue especially is something that helps guide it helps guide the visuals, the expressions and the reactions of the character. If you want to have a character yelling at two characters yelling at each other, you have to know what they're yelling at each other about. So if you want to have a character giving a snide remark, you know, then that then that informs the facial expression they're going to have when they're making that snide remark. And so you lose a lot of control over what the characters, how they behave, what their personalities are, what their dynamics are. If you do that caption dialogue uh, Marvel method. So mm -hmm. I, that's one that maybe some people use. I mean, if it's fine between you and your artist, you know, then go for it. But personally for me, I, I just don't think it's a good method. You know, it, I'm glad you mentioned dialogue. It, it's one of the things that I've noticed. Um, you know, I've been reading your, your comics for a few years now and, uh, it feels like the dialogue has gotten crisper over time that, that you're maybe even more judicious. Like you're, you're able to summarize and, and it's more quippy right now. Like it's really snappy. I like the way your dialogue flows. I like the way it reads. What have you done to improve your dialogue so much over time? Is, have you been studying something or is it a, a method that you use to, to get good, believable dialogue on the page? When you're writing dialogue, one of the, the best things you can do is – choose a voice actor for your character so you know what they sound like and that could inform their personality their uh, the rhythm of their conversations so when i write um so like when i was writing let's see which character is a good one to use for an example um, i was writing a, a western book and the character was a cowboy and i needed a voice for him so i picked like sam elliott you know and so he has that voice, but like, how like would Sam gruff. Elliott say this? Yeah, it's... that gruff, gravelly mm -hmm. um, kind of voice. Like so. Um, but another trick that I learned when writing dialogue is, I, you, when I started, and as you were mentioning, I would overwrite the dialogue. There'd be too much repetition. Um, characters would be repeating their names too many times in conversation, and it would come out kind of awkward. You know, like when you're talking to your sister, you don't do, you don't call her. If your sister's Lisa, you don't call her Lisa at the end of every sentence. You know, you're doing that for the benefit of the audience. But if you want it to sound organic, you know, the audience doesn't exist technically within this narrative. So you don't have to do that so often. And so I kind of learned to truncate the dialogue to make it go quicker and smoother and more organic. And uh, Bill Williams, who is um, a writer, artist, inker, he's um, working on Punchline with Matt Weldon and several other books. Uh, he gave me some great pointers on dialogue. On, and how to keep it brisker. And one of them was that no more than 25 words per speech bubble, because after that, one, it's too many words and it's gonna take up too much space on the page and it's gonna cover up the art if they can fit it in there at all and it'll look bad. And two, if you can't say it in 25 words or less then you're talking too much, so try to trim it down. And so I've been keeping that in mind when, um, when writing my dialogue and it, it's helped help me cut back on exposition and also made the conversations more fluid and um, quicker. So they're, they're a bit, you know, like you said, quippy. They're a bit quippy. Now, I'm not going for like Joss Whedon style, you know, when we think of quips, we think of people going like well, back and I forth mean, talking I mean at more each like other. Banter. It feels like, yeah, like banter is, talk between yeah. people. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to trying to do more of is, is having um, a banter dynamic and, and the exchanges to be more um, natural. And so cutting back the number of words you use actually helps in that a lot. Yeah, definitely. I, I like, uh, you know, some of your examples there. It, 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 you can feel the cadence when I'm, when I'm reading your dialogue and it, and I can absolutely see where it comes from now. I really appreciate those, uh, some of those tips. That's, that's really excellent, uh, advice as far as dialogue. Now, one of the things that, you know, I'm reading a lot of, of older comics, you know, I like to go back and read right now. I'm reading John Burns, incredible Hulk with, with the excellent uh, illustrations by um, Ron Garney and his introductions and transitions of, of scenes are completely different than nowadays. There's so much more intricate and detailed and, and, and the wind blew, you know, upon his hair right. and it was, it was cold. And 
I you missed know, he could that. feel it down to his bones. It, it, I missed I, that personally. I loved <laughs> comics that were written that way. And I would, if I could, I would write comics that way. Um, but audiences right now, that's just kind of not what they want. And we kind of have to give them what they want. And, and yeah, you know, they're more economic, you know, as far as um, mm-hmm. transition. So are, do you have some tips on, you know, how do you move from a scene you know, how much space do you think should be allocated to an establishing shot? Like, you know, so I've seen some pages you'll have like a double page establishing shot or using an entire page, you know, for an establishing shot. But then I've seen other comics where it's more, you know, it's just the upper part or even like a little corner box. And sometimes I feel like that's even more effective. So for scene transitions, that can be a tough one. Aaron Sparrow, uh, he's a friend of ours. He's uh, He write, wrote the Darkwing Duck comic for Boom Studios, and he, he's, uh, he was an editor on the Muppet Show comic and uh, various Disney comics. Uh, he gave us some some pointers, is that you should always transition your between pages. Um, if you're moving from one location to another or one, uh, one perspective to another, like you're changing characters, never do it mid-page. Always have it at, on the next page. Because your pages are like your your scene wipes in a movie, you know? You don't want to have it like it's a jump cut if you have it in the middle of a page. It's just disorienting and weird to do it that Jarring. way. Jarring. Yeah. Um, but with establishing shots, now my personal, I just, I know I just used movie terminology um, and I'm about to contradict myself. Comic books aren't movies. <laughs> and I was using like wipes and transitions just as a, you know, as a comparison, but when you're writing a comic book, you don't want to think of it as a storyboard for a movie uh, because those are totally different mediums. So an establishing shot in a comic book, unless it's something really big and grand, like the reveal of the villain's base, like this is the first time the world had ever seen the Cobra Terror Drome, you know, that deserves like a splash page. But if it's just something like an oil rig out in the ocean and a helicopter landing on it, that just needs to be maybe a larger panel in the top of the page Mm -hmm. or if it's, or even just a half page splash, but it doesn't need to take up so much real estate. And I I use that example of a helicopter landing on an oil rig because I was reading this comic several years ago called the wake. I could tell when I was reading it, that this comic was a pitch to Netflix for a movie or a TV series, because it was doing things like that, where it, re- it read like I was looking at storyboards, and an entire half-page splash was de- dedicated to a helicopter landing on an oil rig, and like it did not need to take up that much space, especially in a medium where you only have 20 pages a month to tell your story, and you just dedicated, you know, half of a page, a, a good chunk of your your narrative real estate to a fairly mundane um, establishing shot. Uh, a helicopter landing on an oil rig is a bit too pe- <laughs> pedestrian makes me sound, you know, like I like, you know, I got a monocle on some champagne, but <laughs> it, it's not like you're revealing the Cobra Terror Drome or the Technodrome or, or you know, the underground base, the, the Legion of Doom's weird Darth Vader head in the swamp, you know, for the first time. It's just a helicopter landing on a helipad. It did not need to take up half a page. Uh, so things like that you have to keep in mind is that you're um, you're not making you're making a comic and a comic does not follow under the same rules as movies or TV shows and you can think in terms of similes like you know turning the page is like a wipe and that's how you keep your um, that's why you put your surprises on your even number of pages because those are the page turns so you want to think of it that way but you also want to think of it as like well this is a comic book and not a movie do I really need to dedicate this much of my narrative space that I could fit four panels in to one panel? Or do I want to use that space to have four panels and move the story along more organically and um, quickly? You, know, you you talked about your surprises, and that's one of the cool things about comic books is, is you can pace the reader on, on what they learn. They don't get to learn anything until you show it to them. You know, so So you definitely don't want to have that surprise looking right at you in the face while the conversation is going to happen. You want them to turn that page and, <laughs> and then the surprise hits them right in the face, right? Exactly. And that can be frustrating. So the page turns and maintaining your surprises for the page turns can be one of the most frustrating things about pacing out your comic 
And sometimes you ha just have to make compromises because you just don't have enough pages to put all your surprises on the page turn. So you kind of have to decide which ones have more impact, which ones are the ones that deserve the page turn, and which one is going to have to sit on the right side of the comic where the person reading the left side of the comic can see it. And if that's the case, then you have to rescript it so you're not treating it as, as much of a, a surprise. Also, when you, when you put your surprise on a page turn, which is um, always on the even page, the thing you have to keep in mind, though, is that if you have to repace the book, if you feel you need to add a page at the end or at the beginning or somewhere and shift things around, you also have to remember that that's going to shift your page turn surprises around. If you put one more page at the beginning of the book, then that's going to move all of your page turns down so that they're no longer page turns. And that's going to screw everything up. You kind of have to, if you're going to add or subtract, you have to do it by two each time so it doesn't affect your page turns or it'll screw everything up. And that can also be one of the more frustrating parts. And you have to be mindful of it, which is also one of the reasons why comics that have ads in them, <laughs> they, they completely screw up the page turns. And so when you're reading like a modern you know, DC or Marvel comic where the people who are, who are scripting it had no idea where those ads were going to be in the book because they're just littered throughout the pages. So they don't even get to have the authority to decide when the page turn surprise is going to be because... It's, it's all just going to be wrecked by ads anyway that shifts things. Um, Dark side eating board. a snicker bar. That, that, I know. That's one of the most <laughs> famous ones. It's hilarious. It, it, it was Doomsday, I think. And it's like Superman mm -hmm. and Batman are fighting Doomsday. And then you turn the page. It's like, Doomsday, you're not yourself. Have a Snickers. And the artist yeah. who did that ad looked the same as the artist who was drawing the main book. And it's like, yes. what the, what's going on? That was very frustrating. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's hilarious. Usually it isn't as funny as all that though, but yeah, you, you always have to you always have to keep those things in mind. I've worked with editors in the past who had who are artists formerly and not writers, so they really didn't know anything about scripting and pacing comics, and I would have to remind them constantly when they would tell me like, "Mark, um, can you add a page here or can you take the page away here?" And I'd have to tell them, "I can do that, but it'll shift all of our page turns and screw up all of our surprises. And they go, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, we'll add two pages or subtract two pages instead. I'm like, okay. Um, but then, you know, an hour later, they would make the same thing. Add a page here, Mark. I'm like, oh my God, you're not listening. <laughs> you know, uh, we've covered a lot of stuff here as far as tips of the trade and stuff. One, th one more, I think I have two more things to talk about. One of the mm -hmm. big ones is, it's something that I find really frustrating. Sometimes, when I get to the end of a story and I know it's not over and there's just a really great cliffhanger, I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want to see. I, I want to come back next week. Very exciting. But there'll be other times when I'm like, the story is over and then they cliffhanger me anyway. And I find that frustrating. You know, what's when should be should people be using cliffhangers at the end of the story to get keep people excited, but not be not be using it too much or become annoying? So I, I feel like um, the best example of that is Jeff Johns, whom I do like as a writer, um, but he's also someone who was, especially in the, the early 2000s, when he was writing like eight books for DC at one time, um, obviously he wasn't going to get his best work out in every single book. And, and to your point, though, uh, Jeff Johns is a good example of that because he likes the cliffhanger and he does it frequently. And there are times when he does it really well. And there's times when he just should have, you know, put a period on his story instead of stringing the, the reader along after an arc is done. If you put another like shadowy figure lurking in the corner saying, I'll be back or ah, I was behind it all along, you know, eventually that gets tiresome and you wear your audience out when it just feels like it's never going to end. That's how you end up with uh, a Spider-Man clone saga from the nineties where it, mm -hmm. it just went on and on and on. And they kept doing these like secret reveal villains who were behind it all. You know, there's always um, another man up the food chain. So when you think the story's finally over, it just keeps going. And eventually they, they do that. Editors like to do that because they want to keep the audience on the hook. So they will keep coming back next month, like a soap opera kind of thing where the story is so serialized, it never ends. But that also has the the consequence of, like I said, wearing the, the reader out where they just finally get sick of it. Like, all right, I've been reading this 
book and you know, it hasn't given me a chance to breathe or take a break for like three years, I'm just going to quit because it just never ends. Mark, I want to say thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, giving some some tips on writing and, and things that you learned over time and, you know, given some of the sources where you got those, you know, Aaron Spar- Sparrow, uh, you know, Bill Weldon, Bill Weldon, Bill Williams, you know, some some great independent uh, writers and editors in, in their own right. You know, uh, and I appreciate you passing these tips on and and hopefully some of my viewers will pick this up and maybe write their own comic one day. I hope so too. And I mean, I'm still growing and learning, but um, you know, unless you're, unless you're Chuck Dixon, everybody's still growing and learning. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'll pick up more stuff and uh, all the other writers out there, I'll pick up more stuff. And if we share what we've learned, we'll all get a little bit better. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, buddy. I'll talk to you later. See ya. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.